If you ever wondered what it's like being part of a Formula One team and working in the pinnacle of motorsport, then you should definitely keep watching because today we are talking to Dalia ramos Guerra from the BWT Alpine F1 team. Dalia is working in Enstone in the role as the head of the test and build department. Don't worry, she will explain in detail what her job is all about in a moment. But we've also talked about a lot of other topics like how she made her way into F1 coming from Mexico and what it's like being one of still only very few female engineers in the sport. The interview will be in English and we recorded it back in June as part of an interview series called Women in Motorsport for the podcast Starting Grid. So if you hear the names of Mas Hafenhauer and Laurent Rossi being mentioned, that's because they were still part of the team back then. That being said, let's get right into it. Hi, Dahlia. Um, thank you for being here with me today. Um, and thank you for being part of this Women in Motorsports series. And welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sophie. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I wish I could speak such a nice German, uh, but I hope <laughs> it's going to be okay for everyone. Yeah, I think so. Um, as I already said in German, you are the head of test and build at BWT Alpine Formula One team. Um, I think there are a lot of jobs in F1 that most fans don't even know of probably. And I think yours maybe could be one of those. So um, we're going to dive into the details a bit later, but could you maybe explain in a few words what your job is about? Absolutely. So Alpine is one of the few works teams, which means that we make our own car, we design our car and we make it in-house. So basically, I'm part of the operations of that and I'm responsible of the last part of the car before it is delivered to the truck. So that means all the mechanical assembly, all the sub-assemblies, everything, you know, powertrain, uh, fuel system, hydraulics, uh, all the small components that go inside the cars, wheel, etc. Then we also have a pre-fit department, which is basically where we prefit all the chassis and I have also the validation testing area which is where we do all the mechanical tests for all the components. So basically just making sure that it all goes well together. How does a typical day in the factory look like for you? Is there even such a thing as a typical day or is every day very different? <laughs> yeah, I think it is more like every day very different. Uh, we always start the day with a morning huddle just to catch up with all the operations, just to understand uh, where everything is at the factory on the day. But after that, uh, it pretty much depends on, on, on what's happening. Um, I try to spend a lot of time in the shop floor because, as I said, I'm responsible for of three or four departments on the shop floor, so I try to spend most of the time with them. But there is a lot of negotiations and a lot of work that happens uh, with the other departments like uh, engineering, designers, uh, control systems. So I spend a lot of my time as well uh, negotiating and working with them. Obviously, if, it, uh, if there's been a race or if there's something happening with the car, then a lot of our time then is focusing on how are we going to resolve that or how are we going to make sure that we get the next upgrade or whatever it is uh, to the track on time. So you have a lot of different tasks, it sounds like that, at least. Um, I also read that you are, or your team, better said, is um, responsible for producing the tools the pit crews are using, for example, as well. Um, I don't know if that's correct. And also that you're looking after the cars the F1 Alpine Academy members are using. So a lot of different things. Um, can you tell me how many people are actually working in your department to do all this? Yeah, so in build and test, we are 40, about 48 people at the moment. It's a department that is growing and that's a split into three main departments, but one of the departments is split into other three sub departments. So it's, it's quite extensive um, it's a big uh, number of people, but I think what we do is very diverse as well. Um, it's very, you know, it's not that like a typical production line where you have the same component happening all the time, though it's, you know, like everyone has very specific and different skills. Yeah. And I would imagine when you say that you are like responsible for three or four different departments, that that also means that you not only have to be good on the engineering side, but also on working with people. Uh, would you agree with that? And what would you say are the main skills that are vital for your role? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you just nailed that because I think from the technical side, I think the most important skill that goes in front of everything is being able to work under pressure. You know, everything we do is always going to be under pressure and it's always going to be, you know, a lot of stress around it. So it's about 
keeping calm and just making sure that decision making and understanding technical uh, the technical specifications and all that part of the car is you know it, it is working well but something that is very very important and i think that's something that I believe in the engineering companies we tend to dismiss a bit is the soft skills, is the leadership, the leadership skills, is the being able to understand people, making sure that they are OK and that they are at their best all the time, because at the end of the day, they are the people who are doing the job. They are the ones that are putting the car together. They are the ones who are, you know, day in, day out making this happen. So it's very important for me that I can lead them correctly, that I can give them the right direction, but also that I can understand them, but I can understand their needs, that I can provide them with what they need. And equally, when I work with other departments, you know, there is a lot of negotiation going on and there is a lot of trying to, you know, trying to pursue both uh, parts best interest. So there is a lot of, of people's skills that sometimes I believe we tend to dismiss and that's when it becomes quite difficult. I think you said that very well. Like I can imagine that it's very important to realize what the team needs to perform at its best because it obviously also brings the best result in the end probably. Um, Dalia, you joined Alpine in June 2021. Um, we are going to talk about your career path a little bit later on. But your first task at the team definitely wasn't an easy one, because as we all know, one year later, um, we started into a new era in F1 in 2022 with new regulations and the ground effect made its return, for example. Um, how big of a challenge was it building this 2022 car, also considering that you were yeah, pretty new to the whole F1 environment in general? Yeah, it, it's interesting because everything was new for me there. So when I arrived, we were already talking about Carville. Carville for us is the winter season, which is when we are preparing the car for the next season. Um, and that should normally start, you know, it starts being more aggressive towards the end of the year and then the beginning of the new year. It's absolutely crazy. And it was very interesting because everyone was talking about this is going to be the worst cars be car build in ages and it's going to be very heavy. And because I didn't know what to expect, really, everything was new and everything was kind of welcome to me. You know, like it, it was very tough. Yes, we spent very, very long hours in the factory, uh, but I was only getting my head around everything at that point. So I didn't have any baseline. You know, I just knew that it was a lot of hard work and a lot of hours and, you know, some things going wrong. And then people, as, as soon as I arrived, some of one of the key members left the team. Uh, so, you know, it was the being left with all the testing area just on my own for the new car. So that was a bit scary, um, but I also think that I was a bit ignorant to how bad it was going to be. So <laughs> in a certain side, you know, that was good as well because I, you know, as I said, everything was new to me. So I was just kind of opening my eyes. It was very challenging for my team, I know that, because they are people who have a lot of experience and they are people who have done this for many, many years and themselves were like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how this goes together. I don't understand this system yet. So and I was trying to help them as, I, as much as I could, but obviously if they were the experts and didn't know, then it was going to be even more challenging for me. But I think that the 23 car bill was probably more, more stressful for me because then I knew what was going to happen. Then I knew what I had to do exactly. And then I knew how things had to go. So when something was not going according to plan, I knew it was going wrong. So I think although the car itself was easier for me, it was a bit more like, right, I have no excuse here. I own this. Now let's try and get it done. <laughs> That's interesting because I would have asked you about uh, this year's car, so I didn't expect that answer. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very funny, actually. Um, I mean, an F1 car consists obviously of many, many individual parts. Like we have the gearbox, suspension, aero parts, brakes, etc. Um, do you actually know how many different or single parts are coming together from one car? We are talking in the range of hundreds of thousands. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. So also a lot of parts that need to be assembled. Um, I guess it can get quite stressful sometimes. Um, you also talked about uh, a bit about that in your previous answer. Um, I'm not sure yet at which time of the year the listeners will hear this podcast, but at the time we are recording this, it's the end of June, which means we are also in the middle of an F1 season. How is the stress level at the moment in the test and build department? Or what is the most stressful time of the year in general for you? Is that the winter period when you are building the car together? 
Yes, exactly. So I would say that at the moment we are in a the stress levels in F1 are always going to be higher than anywhere yeah. else. <laughs> but it's a little bit stable, especially now that we are in the European races, because obviously we have a little bit more time to send parts. And, you know, we, it feels that we are a little bit more in our, I don't want to say comfort zone, uh, but, you know, we know how long it's going to take to get something from Enstone to Austria or, you know, even Silverstone. But definitely the winter season, that's the most stressful part because we need to, especially because of, we need to start um, a little bit early. So that means that we are still finishing one season. We are still delivering the car, you know, to the truck and still need to do very well. But we are already looking at the new car. We are already putting it together. We are already trying to make it work. And we know that anything that gets delayed is going to make it very challenging towards the winter testing. And obviously, once we get closer and closer to winter testing, that's when days are really, really long, really, really stressful because then you start running out of time to, you know, to make things up and correct anything. And I think that's where, and, and, and again, because most of it is new, then when we are testing, when we are putting things together, we are only discovering new things and sometimes, you know, things we need to fix, things we need to change. So that's where the most, you know, the most stressful and the busiest part of the year is. Talking about stressful situations, like um, how do you deal with them personally? Did you find a way yet to stay cool in these situations when maybe not everything is going according to plan? Uh, it's interesting because I think in the specific moments, I think that's something that you learn with time. I think if I if I put if I try to remember, you know, myself uh, 10 or 12 years ago when I started my career, I was really bad at dealing with the stressful situations and I was getting into troubles very very often because I would just explode or I would just, you know, and I think over time I've been getting better at it. Sometimes I surprise myself that I can react in a very calm manner and I can stay objective and even when I feel that okay, this is this is bigger than me, I can just stop and you know go out take some air and then come back and you know try and breathe and make the right decisions i think that's something that i've been learning um with with time definitely with experiences but in general as in in my life um i always need time to switch off every day every day i i like going to the gym i'm actually working towards a personal trainer certification because that's uh -huh. something that i like to do outside work and that's something that is is like a like the place where i find some refuge when where i can just you know escape a little bit and even for example even during car build which is very long days and challenging situations i try to you know disconnect for at least an hour to go do some exercise because i know that that's the time that it, my mind is going to reset and you know everything is kind of going to go a little bit back to normal in my body and then i can be ready to go again Yeah, I think that's very important, right? To just keep your mind off of work sometimes, especially in these stressful periods. And as you already said, like F1 is such a high pressure environment. So I think it's really important to also take care of yourself and to not burn out in the end. And I'm sure that helps your team in the end of well, as well, of course. Um, and I think actually people might underestimate how much work is going on in the factory also before the start of a new season because there's a lot to do obviously um, and one thing I want to talk about briefly is the seat fit because it's yeah something that obviously happens every year because every driver has a seat that's uh, adapted to him personally um, and I think your team is responsible for that as well right? Yeah, that's correct. So basically, we have a generic speed bucket, uh, which is literally a bucket. Uh, that's what we generically design with some of the information we have from the drivers. Uh, but on the day we do the seat fit, it's something very manual. It's, it's quite interesting because uh, we do that, as you said, in my department. We have the final build department where we do all the, the pre-fits. So we put the chassis, the current chassis. Uh, we put the bucket and then the driver has to get all dressed up as if they were gone the race and then they get into the into the car and we have a foam which is uh, in a liquid uh, uh, state and then you pour that foam between the feet and the driver and then it starts expanding and it takes the shape of the driver and then it's all about you know like um, polishing that and making sure the driver is comfortable that they can move around and stuff then we scan it and then that's how we get uh, the final seat for them. Is it very different from driver to driver, what they want and what they need, or is it very similar usually? 
it is different. Um, yeah, it is def different. Obviously, they are all different. Uh, we have Ocon, for example, who is super, super tall. Yeah, um, yeah um, but also, it you know, they have different preferences on how they like to move or, you know, how they like to hold the steering wheel and things like that, pedals. And yeah, it uh, yeah, I don't think uh, we could use the same seat uh, in, with two different drivers. I think Esteban Ocon is actually the tallest driver on the grid, I think. So, yeah, <laughs> Probably, <laughs> this might make yeah. a difference. <laughs> so um, the seat fit is one thing that needs to be done before the season, but there are also other things on the, let's say, to-do list. Um, for example, as we know, the car in its part also has to go through a homologation process before it can hit the racetrack. Um, can you maybe also take us through this process a bit? How does that work? Yeah, the homologation process, I think, is one of the most stressful because first thing you have to do is you have to book the FIA. And it's always tricky because you, you always aim for a date. Uh, but, you know, if things go wrong, you know, and obviously it's a time where the FIA personnel are very busy because all the teams need to do their homologation. So first thing is we need to book the FIA. Uh, once they are, some tests are made in-house, some others are uh, in, in a different facility. Uh, but basically, it's purely having the chassis or the component that we, the structural component we are going to test. Uh, they are just like witnessing everything and we have to apply different loads in different positions just to make sure that it's all safe. So the main um, objective of the homologation is making sure that everything is safe. Um, so yeah, we, we literally just apply more and more and more loads uh, and then at the end the FIA just check displacements or if there is anything going on on the chassis, they sometimes ask you to repeat something. Uh, but yeah, hopefully when everything goes well, they literally just inspect everything and then just thumbs up and then move to the next one. It's it's quite stressful to be honest. I did witness a um, few of them and I, yeah, I found it very stressful, so I prefer to be there for a little bit and then <laughs> sneak out because yeah uh, it just feels that anything can break at any point but obviously it doesn't uh, but yeah it, it's really interesting yeah can imagine that and you're probably very happy when this stuff is all done then and uh, when all this pre-season work is done sooner or later there comes the day when um, yeah the season finally kicks off which is usually um, the day the pre-season testing begins if we like ignore all the filming days etc for a second and that's usually yeah the end of february the beginning of march um, but the work doesn't stop for you does it like what are you responsible for during the actual season when all the pre-season stuff is done yeah, the the work never stops here. Um, we always have to make sure that we maintain um, enough quantities for the race team. So if anything happens at the track, we have to replenish those uh, quantities. But also, we are always working on upgrades. Always, always, you know. And even even if it's just development work, or when we have actually found the upgrade that we want to make, then we have to make it real and we have to make it possible. So in reality, we are always, we never stop. It's always, you know, we're always targeting the next race and the next race and the next upgrade. When parts uh, come back to the factory after the races, I'm also responsible for servicing and maintaining them. So that's the other thing. Even if everything goes super smoothly and nothing breaks and no one crashes, which not always happens, but even if it was like that, we need to receive parts back on the factory, give them service and maintenance, and then send them back to the truck. So it's always, you know, it's constantly working and constantly under pressure as well because typically when you get parts back for service you don't have many days to do that you normally have i don't know two three days depending when parts need to go out for the next race so it's it's always constant um on the clock yeah can imagine that it's especially stressful like with all the double headers and triple headers and whatever so quite stressful weeks then um are you also in contact with the drivers are they giving you feedback as well or are they more talking to the like development department and that side we mostly get the feedback through their uh, engineers uh, really and that then that feedback comes to us. We constantly get that because obviously, uh, for example, I'm responsible for making the pedals uh, to ensuring, you know, all the shafts on the steering wheel and things like that at the right level. Uh, all the hydraulic system, they also, they could also have preferences on the hydraulic system there. So we always get that, but we mainly get it through the engineering department. Uh, when they come to the factory, they are always happy to give feedback. So they 
sometimes I spend time uh, with my department just like chatting about certain things. Uh, but yeah, let's say that in a more regular basis is through their engineering team. How does a race weekend look f like for you personally? Like, are you working on Saturdays and Sundays or are you able to watch the races on TV? How, how does a typical Sunday, let's say, look like for you? <laughs> yeah, I try to be on top of the race uh, and, uh, you know, because it, it try to disconnect a little bit as well. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult than others. Uh, Fridays, uh, Friday race in the factory is normally very, very quiet because and everything that we have to do for the race, we've done it already. We kind of handed over to the race team. Uh, so that's when most people could take the chance to have a little break. Uh, but obviously we start, uh, we start watching FP1, FP2. If everything goes well, then happy days. If not, then, you know, Friday crisis here in the factory. Um, and sometimes the race team get in touch with certain questions during the race weekend. Um, if we done all the right planning that doesn't happen you know too much uh, but yeah most of the times I have the opportunity to just enjoy the race uh, on the Sunday but it's difficult to disconnect you you know you, you see something and you want to go on your phone and see what happened was this my <laughs> responsibility was going to happen you know so it's 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 difficult uh, but yeah I, I try to do my best to to disconnect and enjoy the race. Are you nervous watching the races? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, very, very. To be honest, I think the more I get into these, uh, it's the more nervous I get uh, watching the races. Sometimes, sometimes I wish I could just watch them like any other. <laughs> you know, that they just get excited, and if there is a big crash, they just you know shout and get all this excitement. But yeah, I, I'm afraid that's no longer possible for me because there is always you know this thing on the back of my mind. And hopefully, it's not my car. Hopefully, we didn't do anything wrong. And you know, it's yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it is great, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's that moment of nervousness as well. Yeah, I think it would be the same for me actually. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think there are always like bad and good moments, right? Like you, know, you have, yeah, crashes as you said, where you think, oh no, please not our car, and then yeah, also some uh, yeah, good results obviously. Um, but what would you say when is the race weekend for you personally a success? Is there a definition? Um, you can give me? Um, I think obviously the points, um, that's, you know, I mean, that is success for everyone because we want our car to do better. We do have our own target and um, uh, we have a journey uh, and we want to get on top of the grid, but we know that we need to go, you know, through the journey. So it's not going to happen overnight. So when we beat that target sometimes is, you know, one of the opponents, one of the teams that are very close to us or things like that. Even when it doesn't look like we got the most points, but we know we've done what we wanted to do, then, you know, that's success for us. But the other one is, it's funny, but probably when there is no disaster, that is also success, you know, because once we've done something wrong in my team, we will know and it will be really, really sad. But when we've done everything right, it's like we won't really see it just because we will know that the car is, is, is correct. You know, it's not going to be as noisy as if something goes wrong. But the fact that, you know, we come and we realize that we had no issues with the building, we had no issues with the components, that's also success for me. We are going back to the conversation with Dahlia in a moment, but if you enjoyed the interview so far, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe to this channel down below so you don't miss any new content in the future. It's for free and by doing so you also support our journalistic work. Thank you for that and let's go back to Dahlia. And I guess it's also very important to, you know, have a good result every once in a while, um, like podiums or victories, maybe even just to keep the team motivated, even if you're not like a regular contender for wins or, or podiums. But you already did witness some big results during your time with the team, I think. Um, when I think back to 2021, yes. obviously, with uh, Esteban Ocon's win in Hungary, also Fernando Alonso's podium in Qatar when he was still part of the team. Yeah. And obviously, most recently, also the podium, uh, the third place of Esteban in Monaco. Um, how were these moments for you? How rewarding is to, to get these results in um, with all the hard work you're putting in? Uh, no, well, it's amazing because at the end of the day, I mean, it, I do this for life, you know? My life is around this and, and, and that's where I 
put most of my energy, my time, my efforts, my everything is going to that. So obviously, you know, when we have a good result like those, it's, it, it is difficult not to cry because, you know, it, it's so rewarding. It's so like everything you've done, you know, was, was worth. It's, it's really, really good. And, and it's interesting how also everything goes so fast. You know, whatever you were doing during the week, you will see the results on the weekend. So it, it's very, you know, I don't know. It, it is incredible. It's like you are always at this high energy, high pace. And when it goes well, then, you know, it just gets exacerbated and it's amazing. Yeah, that's understandable. And obviously the part um, of the team that is on site um, always gets to celebrate these results at the track um, as yeah if there's enough time like and the not fly the flight is still a few hours away maybe um but do you also get to celebrate these uh, victories or podiums in the factory in endstone as well oh yeah no, a few days later yeah yeah yeah, yeah. because we know you know it's it's all our effort so we are about 900 employees in endstone at the moment i think the personal that are traveling is about a uh, nine percent of, of all the employees so the majority of the people are in the factory and the majority of the people are the ones that are here every day every single day day in day out trying to make that possible so for us it's, 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 it's a big deal because even when we are not at the track doing you know on tv and stuff it's all our efforts going to that as well so yeah no uh, by all means when we come back on monday you know the energy is amazing in the factory uh, and normally we would have some champagne or something with otmar monday tuesday whenever he's back and you know everyone could celebrate together yeah absolutely That's great to hear and hope you can do that a little bit more often very soon. Um, we already talked about the fact that your job is factory based, but I actually saw some pictures on your Instagram account from the Mexican Grand Prix. I'm not sure which year it was, um, maybe also yes, 2022. Yeah. And yeah, okay, all right, 2022. Yeah. Um, how did the opportunity come about to join the team there? Well, to be honest, uh, Lauren Rossi, who is our Alpine CEO, uh, the first time we had a one to one, he said, you should come to the Mexican Grand Prix. But yeah, you are from Mexico. Maybe we should say that. I think we didn't mention that before. So kind of a home race for you. Yes, exactly. I'm from Mexico City. So when I have my first one to one with him and we talk about that, then that's why he said, yeah, you should come to Mexico. Uh, so yeah, I just, you know, uh, didn't know what to expect. Uh, it's important for the factory people to go to the races because you realize what's happening there. It's like in every in everywhere, you know, you have to understand how the other side is, is working, what their needs are. And in that way, you will be able to work better with them because you will understand them better. So, you know, the company is trying to make the effort to send more people to the track to understand and see how we can do things differently here, but also to appreciate the work that we are doing because We, we live in the factory, you know, we, we don't tend to have all that adrenaline with everyone else and it is very differ, different at the track. So, yeah, for me, it was a little bit of that, of understanding the impact of my role at the track, but it was also leaving all that energy and all that adrenaline and, you know, all the team spirit and the, the day that everyone is competing. And it was just amazing. And as you said, it's, it's, it's my home race for me. So even being in my country was you know, one of the best experiences ever. And you obviously also had the chance to experience the whole atmosphere there. And I think the fans in Mexico are quite passionate about F1, aren't they? Very passionate, <laughs> very yeah. passionate. I think uh, Mexican people, we are quite um, well known for being passionate about, you know, everything. Uh, and with Checo Perez doing so well this season, uh, it's just been, you know, growing and growing, Drive to Survive and all of it is just growing massively in Mexico. We need some more Mexican drivers, <laughs> maybe. Like, really? in the future. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Like, uh, who do we have? Like maybe Pedro Ward or I think Rafael Villagomes is in a free at the moment, but still a long way to go. But yeah, obviously it would be great for the Mexican fans to, yeah, have someone in F1, even if Sergio Perez won't be there anymore in a few years, maybe. Yeah, we talked quite a lot about your job now, I think. Maybe one last question to end this part of the interview, um, to finish it off on a positive note. Um, what for you personally is the best thing about your job? What do you enjoy most about it? The, probably the biggest thing for me is the people. 
I enjoy people. I've always liked to work with people. It, um, it's one of my passions, really, to do things for people. And, you know, it just what gives me energy to be surrounded by people. So that's something I really enjoy. This is, as I, as I mentioned, this is a very people intense uh, job. Um, and obviously, the, the, the fact that we are, you know, anything I do, it's going to be reflected in millions and millions of screens over the weekend. So that pace is, is also very interesting because everything everything you do it just gets like, you know, it's it's exacerbated so much uh, and it's rewarded and you know it's seen in so many places. It, it's great. But also the visibility that's given me to do things differently and to, you know, break some stereotypes and, you know, try and, and support the generations that are just starting and try and give, um, you know, as a female in a male dominated environment, you know, try and give that example, which I didn't expect this job to have for me it was just a job. But now that I realize the impact is having, I think it is just amazing is, you know, that I couldn't expect more from my job, I think. That's lovely to hear. And obviously, we are going to talk about this women in motorsport topic um, in a few minutes. But before that, I would like to know how you actually got in the position you're in today. So I would like to know how you made your way into the world of F1. Um, did you always have a passion for cars or were, was it more or less like coincidence that you ended up in the automotive or motorsport environment? I always loved cars. And that's something that Since I was a child, uh, I've always liked, uh, I grew up with mostly male cousins who love cars. So, you know, I was always going out with them and we were always going to see like all the super sports cars and fancy cars and all of that. And I've got that from my dad as well. But I have to confess that I, I didn't follow F1 before. Um, I think it was a little bit out of my radar. I think when I grew up in Mexico, it was a it was more like an elite sport you know it wasn't for everyone so I kind of didn't look there and to be honest when I started my career in the UK I kind of always tried to get into uh, the automotive industry uh, then I went into aerospace but I always kept an eye on automotive and even when I was looking for this role I wasn't I wasn't really sure what F1 you know what a job in F1 was because I didn't know that because I've always done manufacturing I've always been in factories which is what I love and I didn't know that actually there were the works teams that would have their own manufacturing size where I could do the same job I was doing in aerospace or something similar but making F1 car. So it was a bit, um, let's say, a bit of a coincidence when I was looking uh, for, for roles and then I realized, like, oh, there is a job in F1. How does this work? And then I started getting into into it and then obviously, you know, it just worked out. I think it was the right time for, for both the team and myself. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, that's how it happened. So you said that you're always was always interested um you were always interested sorry in cars in general um but there are obviously a lot of jobs also in the automotive environment so why did you decide to go into the field of engineering in the end well i've always liked the the, the, the challenging side of it um i don't like to do things uh, in the most common way i believe <laughs> so um, so when I started, when I decided to study engineering, I just wanted to, I love maths, I love physics, um, so I wanted to use that, uh, but also I wanted to do something very challenging and something that could really make a difference, you know, something that could really change things, could really change the world, and that's, that's how I got into, into that, really. You first went to university in Mexico then to become a mechatronics engineer. I know that in the UK, for example, there are a lot of possibilities to study engineering, also many, many variations. Um, how was the situation in Mexico back then? How popular was engineering or especially um, mechatronics engineering over there? So when I went to uni and uh, not many years ago, <laughs> uh, mechatronics engineering was uh, was fairly new in the country. Um, and again, I wanted to do the most challenging engineering. So <laughs> I saw mechatronics. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, it, it had the, the, the fame that it was very difficult. It was very new, but also it was very innovative and it was, you know, it was going to change the world. So, so this is what I want to do. Uh, but I think engineering has a very big offer in Mexico, to be honest. We have very good uh, universities. Um, Mexico produces a lot of engineers. We, the manufacturing industry is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, 
economic uh, activity in the country. And actually, automotive uh, industry is massive; it's the biggest one, and aerospace is growing now. So I think I think we we have a passion for that. Um, for me, it was about that, but also I wanted to study. I always wanted to go to prestigious universities, uh, and that meant that I always needed to have scholarships. So that. That was another other thing for me that you know I needed to pursue a place um, that could where I could get a very good scholarship that everything would be paid for and you know I just I just wanted to I just wanted to prove myself I think um, and and do it in the best way so that 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 was the the, the way I believe. I can imagine it's quite challenging at times also, right? Like if you, especially if you say you had a scholarship and you always need to push very hard so you have good results and don't end up losing it and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think it kind of uh, shows that you're also a very hardworking person. I think that, uh, yeah, it's also necessary for working in F1 probably. Um, you then decided not to do your master's degree in Mexico. Instead, you moved to the UK. You already talked about that a bit. Um, and there you studied manufacturing, engineering and management in Nottingham. Um, was it always something you wanted to do to study abroad or was it more um, that you f were forced to go there because there were more work opportunities or things like that? To be honest, the, I always wanted to do a master's degree, uh, but I wanted to do it abroad. It was about making it abroad. Uh, when I was in last year of university, I had the opportunity to do an exchange semester in Sweden. And for me, that was that was the most amazing experience because I realized that We have so many different cultures in the world and so many different ways of doing things and we merge together in a way for one objective. So in that moment, I realized that I really wanted to do my, my post uh, degree uh, abroad. I just wanted to keep experiencing that. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to experience new things. So it was actually more challenging to convince. So I got the scholarship from my government to come to the UK to do my master's. And it was a bit more challenging to prove to them that I needed to do it outside the country rather than inside because obviously you have to justify that because they will invest a lot of money on you and they say well we can offer you that master's degree in the country why would you go abroad so you know it was like I really need to make this work uh, but yeah it was about finding something new. I had actually never been in England before I moved to here. I didn't know anything about Nottingham. It was just about going and explore new worlds and see new things and just have new experiences. And I think most of the things that I've done in my life, most of the big decisions have been because I just want to discover something new. Yes, I have a field where I am developing. I have my professional career, but it's really being permeated by the fact that I want to see something new and discover new things. What, what else is there, you know? Yeah, sounds very nice. And that you were in Sweden maybe helped you also <laughs> to go to the UK afterwards. So it wasn't that much of a cultural shock, maybe, as it would have been without the experience. Because I can imagine, I've never been to Mexico, but I can imagine that it's yeah quite a different life there, actually. It so. is. <laughs> <laughs> um, you then finished your master's degree in 2014, I think, which means it was time to finally join the working world. <laughs> um, what did you do right uh, after you finished university? So actually, well, actually, I have been working in Mexico. So when I finished my degree in Mexico, I joined Procter and Gamble there. I was working there for okay. a couple of years. Uh, and that was mainly because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> I, <laughs> I only knew I wanted to travel. So I decided to start working, save some money. That's where I started in manufacturing. And I realized like, well, this is this is for me, you know, working in a factory where you have the technical stuff, but you also have the people and then you have the product that you see, you know, like as a finished product of what you are doing. So that's when I discovered I wanted to do manufacturing. Uh, then I, I, I came for my master's degree. And really, when I finished the, degree, the master's degree, I was a bit, I didn't really know where to go. I just wanted to keep exploring the world. Uh, so I tried to get into an automotive company, uh, didn't make it. And one of my friends convinced me to apply to Rolls-Royce because uh, most of my colleagues were very crazy about going to aerospace in Rolls-Royce. And purely when I was reading about what they had to offer, the thing that really got my attention was you could do attachments abroad, you could go and work somewhere else in the in a different country if you join the graduate scheme. So I thought, okay, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I started in Rolls-Royce at the beginning in 2015 and I stayed with them for six and a half years. Uh, I worked in Scotland, in Germany, and then two or three different cities in England as well. So yeah, it was, was an amazing journey there as well. 
So if you're mentioning Germany, I obviously have to ask you about it, <laughs> being on a German podcast. <laughs> How did you like it? I mean, you can't say something neg negative now, obviously, but uh, <laughs> you were in Berlin, right? Yes, Berlin. Yeah, I think uh, it, it was actually it was very different to the UK. It was it was a it was a bigger cultural shock than I thought it was going to be. Uh, very very different. But I think it was work wise it's very easy. Um, it, German people at work were very driven and very objective and very to the point, which is something <laughs> that I really like. So yeah, that was good. And it was during the summer as well. So I think uh, yeah, it was an amazing summer there. But I also realized how much I had work to adapt to the culture uh, in England. And I think that's something I didn't think about before I moved. You know, I realized that actually I've been putting a lot of effort to make a life here, you know, to to adapt to the culture, to to learn how to live in this country. So I really valued that at that point. And that's where I decided to come back to England and settle here for a while. And you stayed there also for your job at Alpine, obviously. Um, I Would you also say that, you always say that F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. Would you also say that F1 is the pinnacle of engineering? Yes, I think. So the way we do things here is like you are always working with prototypes. It's like you are always developing. And that's something that I see very different to aerospace, for example, because in aerospace, you have the chance to develop something and then you try it and then you develop it further and then you mature that concept. And then, you know, it's, it's, the phases are much more established and they are longer and, you know, the technology is not too different to the technology we have in F1. But the difference with F1 is that you are always trying different things. You are always trying. If it didn't work for this week and then you move on, you move on. And that obviously, you know, means that you are always pushing the boundaries of engineering, which is really, really interesting. You already said that you like challenges a lot. Is that a reason why you also decided to go into F1 because you simply, yeah, enjoy that so much? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, like the main thing and the very first thing is that when I read the role description, it was the next challenge for me. It was exactly what I wanted to do because there were other jobs in F1 that probably I could have done more easily because they were exactly what I was doing before with a little tweak, just probably the industry. And I felt like, well, I, I know I can do this because I've done it already. <laughs> so it doesn't seem that challenging. And I wanted the, the step up. I wanted, you know, something that had the new uh, thing and something, you know, yeah, it's just something that could challenge me again. And that was this role. So I think it was a combination of that's what I want to do next as a role. And then in the industry yeah it's nice that you also seem to like stepping out of your comfort zone because i don't think that applies for everybody so yeah very good to hear um but speaking of challenges i already said it a few minutes ago that i want to talk about this topic and it's obvious because the title of this podcast series is women in motorsport and you're currently talking to me because you are um, a woman working in the business and there are more females coming into the sport but you are still part of a minority and that's also yeah something i would like to talk about briefly i don't know about you but i luckily always mostly get positive feedback when I'm telling people that I'm doing something related to F1 but there's always this element of surprise first um, do you experience the same that people are still surprised when you are telling them um, about your job simply because you're female oh yeah absolutely absolutely but to be honest I'm quite used to it so for me it's I don't know, it, it didn't change anything when I joined F1. You know, it's always been because I'm an engineer, because I work in aerospace, because I work in F1. Yeah, people, yeah, <laughs> people don't expect it. And it's fair enough. The other day I was partying and <laughs> they asked me if I was a nurse. <laughs> nothing wrong with being a nurse but you know i was i was actually with some other female friends and this guy came and said oh so are you all girls nurses and i said no. why do you say that and he says oh because people come to england to people go to england to be nurses and i was like actually half of them have a phd we're all engineers and i'm working as one so no <laughs> we're yeah. not nurses <laughs> Yeah, there's still a long way to go. <laughs> Let's say it that way. Uh, did it scare you off at any point that the business is so male dominated? Because I think you said earlier that it didn't really cross your mind, right? 
Not really, but again, I think it's because I'm used to it. You know, when when I was working in Rolls Royce, it was quite the same. And um, because because of the area where I am, factories, you know, it, it it's always it's always the same. So for me, it wasn't different really. It was quite interesting because when I first started here, people were like, "Are you sure? Are you sure you're gonna be okay? It's really male dominated." I was like, "Yeah, well, it's normal, isn't it?" <laughs> like for me, it, it is it is not different at all. And of course, there are some moments where I believe I don't realize anymore, but surely there are moments when I feel intimidated because most of the time, 99% of the time, I'm the only female in the room. So, you know, and and especially in, in, in the factory, we are going, moving very, very fast to become more diverse. But it's also true that, you know, it's very, not only the male dominating, but also it's that, you know, most of the population are British and same uh, range of ages and things like that. So, yeah, surely there are moments where, where that intimidates me without me realizing and surely there are behaviors that I don't even notice that I, you know, that people have or that I have, but at least on the conscious level is not something that could put me off. Definitely not. But you definitely bring diversity to Alpine as a team as well. Like, of course, being female and in, in a minority there. But I think you. I also read that with you joining the team, you also became the first female engineer from Mexico. Is that true? Yes, yes. Um, and that's one of the things that the country is appreciating a lot. Um, yeah. The first uh, Mexican female in F1. How important do you think it is as a company in general to have uh, diversity, um, like no matter if it's gender, cultures or whatever? It's super important. And I think the company has realized that very recently. I can tell that from two years ago when I joined, I can really see the difference. When I joined, I think we were about 11% uh, females. We are now in the range of 13. And it's, you know, it's it's two percent, yeah, but it is a big, it is a big number when you think about how the the team is growing. We have more nationalities as well, which we didn't have when I arrived. So that's that's and and obviously that's because you know all the industries in general are realizing that collective intelligence, you know, is not only about showing that we are diverse. No, no, no. It actually the results are better. Actually, we think much better when you have diversity. We bring more ideas to the table. We perform better. Collective intelligence is something very, very important. And I think the company has now realized that and it, there is a very big push to get that, you know, to make it real now. Yeah, and being with Alpine, you already mentioned that you're also part of a team that is progressively, progressively trying to promote diversity in the team that also applies for gender diversity. Like Alpine also launched the Racer program in 2022 with the goal to increase diversity in all roles um, within the team from drivers to engineers to other people working in technical roles. And uh, during my preparation for this interview, I also came across a social media clip from Alpine um, that was also related to the Racer program. And um, there you you also introduce yourself and the job a bit, um, just like you did at the beginning of this podcast. Um, is that also something that is close to your heart to be actively a part of yeah, change at Alpine and in F1 in general by doing stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I always wanted to do, I always wanted to do a job where I could change the world in a positive way. As I said, I like people a lot. And there was a time where I thought, oh, I should be a doctor because doctors can, you know, like directly help people. That's also, that's something that I always wanted to do. I didn't really know that when I started working and I realized I wanted to become a leader, I realized, okay, a leader can change lives because they can improve people's lives at work and stuff. But I never, never thought that I was going to have so much exposure and it was going to give me the opportunity to actually just by being here and just by talking to certain people, just showing the girls that actually you can do that because it is true that when I apply to the job it's true that all I could see during my research and preparation was like the same white type of man you know nothing wrong with it but it makes you feel that you don't belong to that it can make you feel that why am I trying to do this I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it because I don't look like them and you know it's something that we don't have consciously but it happens in our brain so just by giving you know the example and 
making them know that actually, yes, you look like me and you look like whoever you want to look. And it doesn't matter if you don't find yourself in the picture, you will put yourself in the picture. You know, just giving that to the people, it, it's very, very available. You know, it's, it's amazing. And obviously for me, it's like like a dream come true. It's something that I always wanted to do. And it's one of the biggest things that this job is giving me, I think. Do you also feel like you are having a real impact on the team? Like, are you also able to maybe actively make suggestions on what else can be done to get more women into our team? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something I feel really, really proud and very grateful because, to be honest, since I arrived, um, people in human resources, Otmar himself, they've been listening to suggestions. You know, that there's been things that I've talked to them and I've said, look, this worked for me. I think we should do this. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And they take it on board, you know, and and even when it sounds like, oh, it's just a training or it's just this or that, but actually it did make a difference in, in my career. Surely it's going to make a difference in someone else's career. And they take it on board. Honestly, they listen and, and, and they do things because once I spoke to Otman and he said, well, the ideas might not come from me because I'm not. I'm not the person, you know, I'm not one of you. That's why I need you to tell me because, you know, you are the one who knows what, what, what we need here. So I need you to help me. And I think that's, that's been amazing as well. And that's one of the reasons why I feel so happy in Alpine because, you know, I feel, I feel part of it and I feel that, you know, my voice is, is heard as well. So that, that's one of the most amazing parts as well. It's great hearing that. And I mean, there are more and more women coming into the sport, right? But you don't reach milestones like having 30% females uh, in a team within a few days or weeks. Like the most important thing that is going to happen in the future, um, even if it doesn't happen overnight. And I once interviewed uh, Monisha Kaltenborn, the former team principal of Salva, and she also said like women can do everything the men can do, but they need to be given the opportunities. And I think that's yeah, what it's all about, basically. And I mean, there are different initiatives, like if it's from teams like the Racer program by Alpine or also Dare to be Different by Susie Wolf. Um, I think F1 Academy also recently joined a program with Discover Your Drive that also aims um, yeah, at increasing diversity and um, bringing bringing more females into the sport. Um, is there anything apart from that where you would say, okay, we or F1 or whoever need to do more of this or that to get more women into the sport? Or do you think we are already on a very good way right now? I think we are doing very well. Um, I think we also have to be preparing from the inside. And that's a point that I always like to make. It's not only about what we tell the people outside. Um, it's important to reach out but we also have to transform ourselves from the inside. So when people join, they are welcome. They are expected. People know what to do with them. And that's something that I am always highlighting. You know, it's not only about external work, it's the internal work. It's just like, you know, if you want to offer something to people, you want you need to change yourself from, from, from your inside. And it's the same here. And I think we are doing it. Don't get me wrong. We are doing it. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, why, why do you have to educate me as a female to tell me that I can be here. Why don't you educate your males as well and you make sure that they know how to behave with me. They know how to welcome me. They know how to make me feel part of the team. So that's also part of the of, of, of the push that sometimes is not very much talk about. It's important and, and, and we are doing it. And yeah, I think the other the other side of it is just making sure that people, you know, we, we stop demanding perfection uh, on females and we just let them know that they can do everything they want, I believe. I think it's great to hear that. And it's also great to talk to you because you can, or I at least can feel the passion you have for that topic. And you also come across as a person that really wants to inspire the next generation, which is really nice to see. And uh, yeah, that's why it's a shame that we are slowly but steady coming to the end of this interview because we are running out of time. Um, maybe one last question to finish it off. Um, I think you maybe mentioned um, something you could answer on this question already in your previous answer, but is there anything that your job taught you or that you learned about yourself through your work that you can maybe pass on to the listeners that maybe wants to start, uh, want to start a career motorsport themselves? Is there any advice you can give? Wow. Um, that is a question that can reach <laughs> many, many things. Um, <laughs> this is just probably one of the most recent things. Um, never doubt of yourself because some people are going to have doubts about you. Some, people's, some people are just going to be scared because they actually have no doubts that you're going to do very, very well, but they will want to put doubts on you. 
don't buy that. I think that's that's the that's the main thing, and that's one of the big lessons that I've had recently. You know, don't don't doubt yourself. If you think it's the right thing, just just do it. Just do it. I mean, I think it is it is it is worse to regret not having done something that having done it and actually it didn't go as I wanted or it wasn't probably the best the best thing. But I think the most important thing is just don't doubt yourself. Just if you think you can do it, it's because you can do it. If you think it's a good idea, it's because it's a good idea. Definitely. Yeah. Lovely. I think that's a very good answer to finish it off. Um, one last uh, thing. If people want to follow you on yeah, social media, maybe, or, or to get some more insight into your job, where can they find you? If you want to share that, of course, you don't have to. Um, I have my Instagram. Um, I'm, I try to be active on Instagram, but I'm going to say something. I'm so busy that I just struggle. I'm always running from the factory to the gym to the house and then repeat. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm uh, Dalia underscore Greenleaf uh, on Instagram. And yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Okay, so make sure to follow Dalia there. And uh, Dalia, thank you so much for sharing all these stories with me and the listeners today. It was a pleasure to hear all these stories. And I wish you, of course, all the best for the future and also for the rest of the season. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sophie, and thanks for the opportunity as well. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dalia ramos Guerra and that you got a good insight into her job as head of test and build at Alpine. And if you now want to see some more content about the team from Enstone, make sure to check out the next video where Kevin Scheuren takes you behind the scenes of the factory and the CS car launch.